Okay, we're up to, well, we were up to 42 and somebody disappeared. Uh, so before anybody else leaves, I guess we'd better start. <laughs> so we are talking today about the books of Chronicles. Chronicles uh, doesn't really get a lot of respect in the Bible. In some respects, I think you might wonder why it's in there at all. In many ways, it's almost a post-biblical book because it is essentially a rewriting of the books of Samuel and Kings. Now, what we call rewritten Bible, rewritten scriptures, or whatever name one wants to give them, uh, becomes very... Um, becomes very common in the later Second Temple period. There are books like Jubilees in the second century that retell the story of Genesis and part of Exodus. Uh, later on, there's a book that we call Pseudophilo that retells the story of Judges. So uh, this is something that people increasingly did. There are also fragmentary rewritten biblical texts in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Sometimes you get the impression that they're actually trying to replace the original biblical text. I'm not sure that's the case with Chronicles, but in any case, they did not succeed if they did. They weren't rewriting the whole of the Deuteronomistic history, but they're rewriting you know, essentially beginning with the, practically from the death of Saul and then on down uh, at least through Hezekiah and uh, pretty briefly on, on Josiah at the end. Um, some people think that it actually was an independent history of Israel from a Judean perspective. It gives a lot more prominence to Hezekiah than is the case in the Book of Kings. But for all of that, I, I must say I'm not persuaded by that. I think this is uh, rewritten. It's really, in many ways, an expurgated edition of the history, especially of Judah. Much less attention to the Northern Kingdom than was the case in Kings. It is clearly written in the Second Temple period, and we'll see why in a minute. You can divide it into three sections. First of all, First Chronicles chapters 1 to 9. Then First Chronicles 10 to Second Chronicles 9. That's David and Solomon. That's a huge chunk of it. Uh, and then uh, from there on to the end. At the end in Second Chronicles 36, there is mention of the restoration after the exile. They trace the genealogy of David for five generations after the exile, so it can't have been written before that. So that would at least bring you down well into the 400s. Most people would put it a little bit later than that. Um, but uh, in any case, it is clearly Second Temple period. Now, the first nine chapters are made up of genealogies. Great material for tests, if one were really specific about it. Uh, but, if, uh, you know, it's wh why the obsession with everybody's uh, genealogy, you may, may wonder. Um, uh, well, it's because it's a priestly interest. One of the things that's mentioned is that some in the book of Ezra is some people coming back weren't at missing because they couldn't prove their genealogies. So genealogies, very important from a priestly perspective because that kind of established who you were and the, the rights that you might expect to enjoy. It's not the most scintillating reading. Um, it, Judah's genealogy is prevented first and at greatest length. Then it skips the episode of Judah and Tamar. This is typical. You don't want to tell stories about your ancestor going off and thinking he's having relations with a prostitute. Uh, 
And it has some genealogies that have no basis earlier in the Bible. Uh, Levi and Benjamin also get some attention, but it's primarily from a southern perspective, from the kingdom of Judah. But we'll pick up the story in 1 Chronicles chapter 10. And this is where we get to the, the death. You're starting out pretty much with the death of Saul. In chapter 10, verse 13, we're told, Saul died for his unfaithfulness. For he was unfaithful to the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord. Moreover, he had consulted a medium. Now, again, very typical of Chronicles. If Saul died suddenly, it must have been punishment for something. And it's only a question of identifying what the sin was. And the nice one that was available was that he consulted a medium. And according to Deuteronomy, you weren't supposed to do that. Now, move on then to David. And uh, the account of David in chapter 12 has a lot of lists in it. It lists all the people who, who joined him. There were mighty warriors. And uh, also already in chapter 11, you have the warriors of the army, various officials, and so forth. All of that kind of creates... Uh, an illusion of historicity, I would say. You know, it, it's a technique one may use if you want to make your narrative seem historical. Put in lots of details. Put in names. No way, of course, anybody is going to be able to verify any of those anyway. One of the more interesting things in the story of David is the story of the bringing up of the Ark to Jerusalem. Now, if you remember, in the book of Samuel, this became a somewhat scandalous incident because David, we're told, danced before the ark. And at that point, he had married a daughter of Saul, and she was disgusted at this and said, what kind of a performance is this by the king of Israel uh, jumping and exposing himself? Uh, so the implication is that when David danced, he did so with abandon and showed off a little bit more than she thought he should. Now, he's not going to get away with that in Chronicles. In 1527, David, we're told, when he's going up with the ark, was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who were carrying the ark and the singers, and Kanana, the leader of the music of the singers. Chronicles is a very musical book. There an awful, there's an awful lot in it about singers' liturgy. That's one of the great obsessions. And the ceremony here, bringing up the ark, is followed then in chapter 16 with a medley of passages from Psalms that indeed were probably passages that were uh, common in use in the liturgy. But nothing here about David jumping or leaping or anybody having any grounds to reproach him for the way he does it. A key passage in 2 Samuel and again here is 2 Samuel 7, which is retold here in uh, 1 Chronicles 17. When David settled in his house, David said to the prophet Nathan, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to live in. Uh, I haven't lived in a house since I brought Israel out of Egypt. And uh, instead, he says, and moreover, I declare to you, this is in verse 10 of First Chronicles 17, that the Lord will build you a house. All of this now is following Second Samuel chapter 7 uh, pretty faithfully. And moreover, I declare to you, the, the Lord will build you a house. When your days are fulfilled to go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, 
I will establish his throne forever. This is all still faithfully enough following Samuel. And uh, I will not take, um, I will be a father to him. He shall be a son to me. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who was before you. That is also following Samuel, but with the notable omission that in 2 Samuel 7, it says that if he offends against me, if he sins against me, I will punish him with the rod of men, but I will not take my steadfast love away from him. Chronicles airbrushes out the bit about punishment. That's not on the agenda. And then I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Back in 2 Samuel, what was said was, I will establish his kingdom. Um, I will not take my steadfast love away from him. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, the difference there, you may say, is fairly subtle. It's easy enough to read over it and not see it. But what Chronicles is doing is saying that I will make him, uh, give him a place forever in my house. Now, in the Lord's house means in the temple. This was a problem to be dealt with in the second temple period. According to 2 Samuel, God had promised that there would always be a king from the line of David on the throne in Jerusalem. After the Babylonian exile, this was no longer the case. What do you do with that? Now, uh, one thing they will do with it eventually is saying that God will restore the kingship. That is to say, he will bring a messiah. Chronicles isn't there yet. What Chronicles says is, I would give him a place in my house, in the temple. According to that long passage at the end of the book of Ezekiel, the prince who would be the, the uh, Davidic descendant, if you like, was to have a job in the temple, in connection with the temple. He was to ensure that the temple would be provided for. Now, by the time Chronicles was written, I think it's very doubtful that there was any known descendant of David around. That's a disputed question, because in the New Testament, it is claimed that Jesus was descended, even if through Joseph, uh, from the royal line. But I think that we don't really have any evidence of anybody who was known to be descended from the line of David for a couple of hundred years before the time of Jesus, actually for, four, for maybe 450 years before the time of Jesus. The last Davidic descendant who is mentioned is here in Chronicles in the fifth generation after, Dave, after um, the exile. Uh, early on in the book. So I think what Chronicles was doing is saying, instead of the temple, what you have now, instead of the kingdom, what you have now is the temple. And everything becomes extremely temple focused. It goes on in First Chronicles 18 to 20, uh, discussing the wars of David. Most interesting thing about these chapters is what it doesn't say. And this gets to be predictable after a while. What will Chronicles say about David and Bathsheba? Absolutely nothing. Skip it. Uh, no mention of the rape of Tamar or of the rebellion of Absalom. In other words, this is airbrushing the history of Israel as you had us in Kings, and it, it's wiping out anything that might be construed as disreputable or that might bring the light of David into disrepute. In chapter 21, uh, 
Now, the, the parallel here is in 2 Samuel 24. In 2 Samuel 24, it's the Lord who incites David to take the census. In 1 Chronicles 21, it's Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to count the people of Israel. Now, I believe we have met Satan once so far in this course, and that was in the book of Zechariah. And in the book of Zechariah, he seemed to be a prosecuting attorney in the heavenly court. We will meet him uh, in a week or so in the book of Job, where he seems to be more like um, a muckraker, somebody who goes around finding dirt on people, kind of public prosecutor, if you like. Now, what exactly his role is here, not so clear. But what is, uh, what is clear is that he is not yet the devil. He hasn't yet been kicked downstairs, so to speak. This will happen probably in the second century BC. But up to this point, Satan is somebody who has a, a job to do for God, if you like, but the job is testing people. And testing them mean, can mean tempting them. What is so bad about counting the people of Israel? Taking a census. You know, you may all have gotten census forms in the mail recently. Well, this is the root of it. Satan incited David to do this uh, back, back in the day, and they're still at it. Now, why? Well, <laughs> I think the main reason people might feel, well, there are various people, reasons people might feel uneasy about it nowadays, I suppose, especially if you're in the country illegally. Uh, but also, it's always been tied to either taxation or the draft. And this, of course, is what why David was doing it too. Uh, this is preparatory for drafting the young men into his army and also for taxation. Why is it construed as a sin here? Well, I think it's construed as a sin simply because it was extremely unpopular. And this was something that would bring, uh, bring David into disrepute in, uh, in Israel in his day. And so they say, oh, big mistake. And, uh, but, but also, it's a problem, you see, if it's God who incited him to do it. But uh, here, this is passed off on Satan. Why is Satan eventually invented? Meaning by Satan, a devil. No place for a devil in most of the Hebrew Bible, most of the Old Testament. Now, why does he become necessary? Because you want to explain the prevalence of evil in the world, and you don't want to blame God for it. Amos could say, uh, without any qualms, if something bad happens, Yahweh must have done it. By the time you get to Chronicles, you can't say that anymore. You've got to be looking for some other way of explaining it. Now, so, and then what the Lord did to punish uh, David for this is the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel. And uh, I suppose it's surprising and a little bit of a relief that in the present uh, plague that is upon us, I don't think anybody has come out and said that it was a divine punishment for something or other. Uh, not too long ago, that people said that about the AIDS epidemic. Uh, but at least I hope, uh, I hope people will hold off that one uh, this time around. Now, after this census then, um, he, David buys the threshing floor where the temple would be built. And the interesting little nuance on that, this is in verse 20, chapter 21, 1 Chronicles 21, verse 
25. David paid Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the site. The interesting thing about that is that in 2 Samuel 24, he got it for 50 shekels. How's that for inflation? It probably gives you some indication, you know, of the amount of time that has passed between the time when Kings was written, when 50 shekels seemed a good price for a piece of land, and the time when Chronicles was written, when it's gone up to, to 600. Now, there is no discussion. One of the big issues in the books of Samuel is the succession. There is a whole section of the books of Samuel that is known as the succession narrative. And it's high intrigue. Solomon was not originally the one in line to the throne. And uh, it's, you know, various people have to get bumped off in order to make room for him. Also, in 1 Kings for chapter 2, 1 Kings chapter 2, you're told that when David's time to die drew near, he charged his son Solomon, be strong and courageous, keep the charge of the Lord, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes. And um, so if your heirs take heed to walk in my way, they will not fail. Moreover, know also what Joab did to me how he dealt with two commanders of the armies of Israel, whom he murdered. And act therefore according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. And he goes on like this with various other scores that Solomon ought to settle, telling him, it is the scene out of the Godfather, it's telling him these are the people who will be a threat to you if you leave them alive. Act according to the wisdom that is in them, in you, and get rid of them. Now, needless to say, he is not going to say anything at all like that in Chronicles. In First Chronicles 23, when David was old and full of days, he made his son Solomon king over Israel. Why Solomon, reading Chronicles, you think this was the obvious choice. Then David assembled all the leaders of, of Israel and the priests and the Levites. The Levites, 30 years old and upward, were counted, and the total was 38,000. 24,000 of these, David says, shall have charge of the work in the house of the Lord. Now, what he now goes on to do on his deathbed, according to Chronicles, is uh, organize the liturgy, in effect. Huge numbers. In 2328, um, he says their duty, the duty for all these Levites, thousands of them, shall be to assist the descendants of Aaron for the service of the house of the Lord, taking care of the courts and their chambers. And they shall stand every morning thanking and praising God, and likewise at the evening. This also comes to be why David writes so many psalms. He's setting up the liturgy. This is the one thing on his mind before he dies. Now, not only that, but in, um, in chapter 28, he will go one better than that. In 28, verse 11, David gave his son Solomon the plan of the vestibule of the temple and its houses, its treasuries, its upper rooms, its inner chambers. Now, again, you see, this is a minor scandal in the Book of Kings uh, or Samuel. Why didn't David build the temple? And in 2 Samuel 7, it actually says that the Lord had given him rest. But Solomon will say then when he dedicates the temple, well, David, the Lord didn't give him rest, so he never was able to get around to it. Chronicles drops that one altogether. No mention of the Lord giving him rest. Uh, and what he does in fact, then, is 
David had it all planned. So the reason David didn't actually get around to building it is he was too busy drawing up the plans. And um, so the temple cult ultimately goes back to David nonetheless. Um, Solomon then moves to build the temple right away at the beginning of Second Chronicles. He conscripts foreigners to build, but not Israelites. Whereas in the book of Kings, he did conscript Israelites. And that is what caused the rebellion and uh, caused eventually led to the northern tribes breaking off. The site of the temple is identified in Chronicles as Mount Moriah, where Abraham nearly sacrificed Isaac. Uh, the dedication of the temple occupies three chapters in chapters five to seven and then fire comes down from heaven to consume the sacrifices. No mention is made of his love of foreign women, although his marriage to Pharaoh's daughter is acknowledged in passing. In Kings, this was one of his great achievements, right? Something, what, like 1100? Uh, well, in any case, endless foreign women. But none of that appears in Chronicles. And so Solomon's reign gets relatively short shrift. He's subordinated to David. In 11.5, then, you get, in Second Chronicles 11.5, you get to Rehoboam. Rehoboam did recite, this is Rehoboam now, who was the son of Solomon and became king after him. And the priests in, in chapter 11, verse 13, the priests and Levites who were in all Israel presented themselves to him for all, from all their territories. The Levites had left their common lands and their holdings and had come to Judah and Jerusalem because uh, Jeroboam and his sons had prevented them from serving as priests of the Lord and appointed his own priests for the high places. Now, it's nothing like that in Kings. What Chronicles is doing there is having the Levites, no, the, the, the true priests and Levites all come up to Jerusalem already in the time of Rehoboam. One of the things that they tend to do when they rewrite the Bible is to read back later regulations into the earlier period. In the book of Jubilees, uh, you find the patriarchs are already observing the law of Moses, even though they didn't really have it, you know, but they already, you know, knew it in principle. That's the idea. So the tendency is to make them perfectly orthodox from a very early point. And I think that's also what's going on here with Rehoboam. Uh, but then in chapter 12, we're told that he abandoned the law of the Lord because something had to go wrong at some point. One of the big innovations in the accounts of the kings of Judah is the story of Jehoshaphat who gets extensive treatment in chapters 17 to 21. Now, the interesting thing about this, you see, is that Jehoshaphat doesn't get any treatment to speak of in Kings. But here, he becomes a major figure. Now, in making him a major figure, the author of Chronicles, I don't think he had independent traditions about him. I think he is just using the occasion to present what a good king would look like. And in 179, uh, he, well, is, yeah, uh, well, just before that, in 177, in the third year of his reign, he sent his officials to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them were the Levites. They taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went around through all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. 
Now, outside of Chronicles, the nearest thing to that happens in the time of Ezra, after the exile, when Ezra brings back the law of the Lord and has it read out in Jerusalem, and we're told the Levites were explaining it to the people. Now, according to Chronicles, Jehoshaphat, several hundred years earlier, had actually sent out Levites to do this, having the book of the law of the Lord. Now, you see, they didn't really have a book of the law of the Lord in the time of Jehoshaphat. This is only found in the time of Josiah, according to Kings, and it's conspicuous by its absence through most of the period of the kingship. But again, Chronicles once doesn't want to admit that there was major change like that in the nature of the religion. And so you have Jehoshaphat, uh, who, you know, where you have a free hand, you're not impeded by any information about him. So Jehoshaphat can be held up as a king who was doing this right and using the book of the law of the Lord and having the Levites go around to explain it. Second Chronicles 20 is still now in the time of Jehoshaphat. And this one is interesting as the, the kind of ideal construction of how a battle should be fought. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom. Jehoshaphat was afraid. He set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed to fast throughout all Judah. Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord, and he prayed. And now this is also, I think, very typical of the second temple period. You get a lot more prayers and a lot more prayers quoted. And you see, they give you an opportunity to kind of state your beliefs. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, and he said, Listen, thus says the Lord, do not fear or be dismayed, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. The battle is not for you to fight. Take your position, stand still, and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. Do not fear or be dismayed. So Jehoshaphat bowed down, and so they did this, and they went out and sang, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. And as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the Ammonites, Moab and Mount Seir. For the Ammonites and Moab attacked the inhabitants of Mount Seir, destroying them utterly. So in other words, what happens then in this battle is that two groups of the enemies of Judah attack each other, and they kill each other off. And all that is required of the Israelites is believe and don't actually do anything. Pray. Now, there was maybe a touch of that in the story of the capture of Jericho in the Book of Kings, where what they did is march around the city seven times, perform a ritual, and then the walls fell down. It's taken a step farther here. You will also get some of this later on in the Dead Sea Scrolls in a document called the War Scroll, which tells them how they should line up for war against the Kittim, that is to say the Romans. And again, it's counting on the Lord to do the actual fighting. Now, whatever else I think you may say about this, this is not a reflection of historical reality. This isn't the way things actually happened uh, in Israel, but it's the ideal. And it's an ideal that is putting more and more emphasis on faith, if you like, on trusting in the Lord to do things for you. And it is very much a temple-based theology. In chapters 29 to 32, there is an extended account of the reign of Hezekiah. 
And the interesting thing there is that in the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now, there is some mention in Kings of a reform by Hezekiah, but it's done very briefly. Um, in chapter 30, he then sent word to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh. Actually, in chapter 20, there was already reference to a letter that the prophet Elijah allegedly wrote. In the book of Kings, it looks pretty much that Elijah was illiterate. Would not have been able to write anything at all. Letters really only become common in the period after the exile. And one of the reasons for that is that that's when Aramaic got to be widespread. The Aramaic language was spread by the Assyrians. The Assyrians also used cuneiform. But now if any of you, um, have, well, at least Jonathan can tell you about the, the problems. If you want to communicate with people in Akkadian, you've got a job on your hands. You know, if you have got to make tablets and carve all your complicated signs into it, this does not facilitate communication. Letters became possible when you were using Aramaic with an alphabetic script, and then papyrus eventually becomes, and also animal skins become uh, available as media. So this is another anachronism in Chronicles that the way uh, that he gathers people or sends out, in the earlier period, what they would have done was send, um, send a herald around to announce things. Uh, now, Hezekiah is using letters. Also notable, though, is that according to this, uh, Hezekiah is the one who attacks the high places and... Uh, there's some basis for that in 2 Kings chapter 18, but also he's the one who celebrates the Passover for the first time since the time of Joshua. Now, in Kings, it's Josiah who does that. Why exactly they should want to lift up Hezekiah isn't altogether clear, but already in Kings, you see Hezekiah comes off as a good king. And I think from the perspective of Chronicles, if he was a good king, then he must have kept the Passover. And so, again, it's an effort to burnish his image and also maybe to burnish the continuity of the tradition of things like the Passover. The bad king in both kings and indeed in Chronicles is Manasseh. He comes up in Chronicles, in 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 33. And as in Kings, you see, at first he does everything wrong. He erects altars to Baals, made sacred poles, worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and so forth. But Chronicles also changes the history of Manasseh. Uh, he is taken prisoner to Babylon by the king of Assyria, and that already is garbled, because why would the king of Assyria take him to Babylon? It's kind of mixing up the Babylonians and the, the Assyrians. But uh, then uh, he repents. And uh, at the end of uh, 33, the Lord spoke, to Manasseh and to the people, but they gave no heed. Then the king of Assyria took Manasseh captive. While he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. He prayed to him, and God received his entreaty, heard his plea, and restored him again to Jerusalem. Now, the prayer of Manasseh then becomes a book in its own, right? Actually, you will find it in the Septuagint or the Greek translation of the Bible. It's in the Apocrypha 
It is not one of the books that made it into the Catholic Bible, but it's in the larger collection of Apocrypha, and it was you know, a popular pietistic book somewhere around the turn of the era. But why should Manasseh be credited with repentance and conversion? And I think that's simply to explain why the final destruction of Jerusalem didn't happen in his time. This, you see, is another odyssey in the history as it's recounted in Kings, because there, you know, it's really because of the sin of Manasseh that Jerusalem is destroyed. But the Lord's timing is a little bit off, you know, and it doesn't hit until after Manasseh is dead and gone. And it comes then, you know, after you have had a perfectly good king in Josiah come in between. And so I think this is a way of explaining why Manasseh was not punished. It's because, uh, you know, it's because he must have repented. Conversely, you have to explain why did Josiah die young? Exactly what happened to Josiah isn't altogether clear. We're told that he went to meet the king of Egypt and that the king of Egypt killed him. Now, in Chronicles, that is made into a battle. In Kings, I think it probably meant that the king of Egypt had him executed, that he wanted to replace him as king in Jerusalem. He didn't like him for whatever reason. In here in chapter 34, 35, uh, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He always did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a boy, he instituted the reform. In Kings, if you remember, he started the reform, and in the course of the reform, he was repairing the temple, and they found the book of the law of the Lord. Uh, here, but, but that was just in the course of repairing the temple. Here, he has already instituted the reform uh, before any of that happens. So, again, it's saying he was doing the right thing even from the start. But... It then describes his death as being killed in battle, and it gives a reason for it in 35, verse 22. And after the archers shot King Josiah, and, uh, the, rest, and the reason that we are told that this happened to him was because he didn't listen to the words of the Pharaoh Necho, that were from the mouth of God. So even Josiah must have been guilty of something, even, uh, even though he still comes off as one of the really good kings uh, in all of this. So uh, finally, the wrap up in Chronicles 36, 15, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people. And they kept mocking the messengers of God and despising his words uh, and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord came upon them. So according to Chronicles, then, it is all perfectly simple uh, that whatever bad happened to the people, was always um, was always due uh, to the, their failure to keep the law, but the system was all laid out. Now I saw that there were a few messages in uh, in the chat, uh, but I think they all had to do with asking people to mute. Uh, at this point. Does anybody have any question or comment that they'd like to raise? Wrap it up. If so, just unmute, unmute yourself and speak up. <laughs> yes, Georgia. Um, the order in the Hebrew Bible and the order in the like New Testament Bible 
does it have any meaning that the order is different? Ah, you know, that is a, a much debated question. I think the usual opinion is in the Christian Bible, you put the prophets at the end of the Old Testament. And the reason for that is to lead on into Jesus. Because the idea is that the prophets were foretelling Jesus. This was not always the case. You know, down as late as the Reformation, the order of the books varied. Now, in the, the, what you have in the Hebrew Bible is probably closer to the order in which they were composed. You know, that the prophets were older, or at least they were collected into a book uh, earlier than the writings. And that was preserved. And also, you know, in the Jewish tradition, the main emphasis is always on the law. The prophets are regarded as interpreting the law and so forth. So, you know, I think that's the probable explanation of it. But, you know, there's a lot of variety in that down through the tradition, and I wouldn't want to read too much into it. Professor, I have a question. Um, when you were talking about this, the sin of the census, um, that it was unpopular, is there any kind of connection between uh, census taking and um, kind of what some of the prophets are railing against with kind of the social justice idea of um, kind of the poor being um, taken advantage of by the kind of wealthy and the, the, the rise of the aristocracy and as we find like in the northern kingdom? You know, uh, I think there probably is a connection, but it's, it's indirect. You know, it isn't, uh, not all uses of the census were necessarily oppressive, but it could become an instrument of oppression. So you know, I think actually what the objection was, was the increase in government control. You know, that this is, uh, whatever you make of it, in Israel, the tradition was that there were originally tribes. Originally, they didn't have a king. And now having a census goes with getting a king, and it's tightening up the government control. And you may remember there was an argument about that in Samuel. Is it good to have a king or is it not? And in the end, they settle for it as something that you have to have. Chronicles doesn't recognize that debate at all. Chronicle, from Chronicles' point of view, of course, it's good to have a king. But then all the king is really doing is singing psalms and setting things up in the temple. So this isn't a very realistic recreation of what the monarchy actually had been like. Okay, uh, next day, we'll move on to Proverbs. And this then starts us into the next phase in the course, which deals with the wisdom literature. Now, Proverbs is arguably the oldest stratum of material that you have, or contains, not all of it, but it contains the oldest stratum of material that you have in the Bible. It's, some of it is just folk wisdom. And some of that could be very old. The book of Proverbs probably put together also in the Second Temple period. But it's a very different way of approaching the whole question of religion from what you have had in the prophets, especially. So on Wednesday, we will take up uh, Proverbs. So Naila and Jonathan, if you can stay on for a few minutes, and for the rest of you, have a good day or two, and see you remotely on Wednesday.